Okay, good evening. I think we are all set here. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to pick up tonight in our study of the book of Lamentations. And I am excited about uh, what we've been covering. Um, the book of Lamentations is a poetic book. And it goes along with a study that um, I've been doing at home with my girls, with my daughter. And uh, so the Book of Lamentations is a set of five poems. And they're all composed probably close to the same time. And of course, they all build on one another. And we, the last two Wednesday nights, we've covered the first two sections of uh, Lamentations. And tonight we're going to get into section three, which is chapter two. So we're actually getting into the second poem. Um, remember that in the first section we talked about the preacher's attitude and role in speaking the truth about God, and that was in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. And then last week, we saw the second half of that poem, verses 12 to 22, in which the city of Jerusalem herself, personified as a woman, was confessing her sin and was crying out for the justice of God. And so here today, we're going to be moving towards the um, third section, or at least that's the way I'm dividing it um, as far as my presentation goes, and we're going to be dealing with the first part of chapter, um, chapter two, or the second poem of Lamentations. This poem is again the preacher speaking, but his style is much more didactic or, shall we say, impersonal. Um, he is laying out a series of understandings for the, um, for the nation of Israel, but he's laying them out according to a specific theological viewpoint. So, let's start by reading Lamentations chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Lamentations 2, 1 to 8. I'm pulling it up here now. It says, How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger, and cast her down from heaven under the earth, the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord hath swallowed up all the inhabitations of Jacob, and hath not pitied. He hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He hath brought them down to the ground. He hath polluted the kingdom, and the princes thereof. He hath cut off in his fierce anger all the horn of Israel. He hath drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. He hath burned against Jacob like a flaming fire, which devoureth round about. He hath bent his bow like an enemy. He hath stood with his right hand as an adversary, and slew all that were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion. He's poured out his fury like fire. The Lord was as an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He swallowed up all her palaces. He's destroyed his strongholds and has increased the daughter of Judah's mourning and lamentation. He hath violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were a garden. He hath destroyed his places of the assembly. The Lord hath caused the solemn feasts and the Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion and hath despised in the indignation of his anger 
the king and the priest. The Lord hath cast off his altar. He hath abhorred his sanctuary. He hath given up into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They've made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of the solemn feast. The Lord hath purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He hath stretched out a line. He hath not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore, he made the rampart and the wall to lament. They languished together. And then after that, I'm going to skip down. After verse 8, I'm going to skip down and read verse 17. The Lord hath done that which he had devised. He hath fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old. He hath thrown down and hath not pitied and hath caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He hath set up the horn of thine adversaries. And we're going to stop right there. Let's pray. Father, as we look into your word, help us to perceive your thoughts and your mind. And Father, at least show us what you would have us to know and to learn from these scriptures. Would you be with us tonight? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in the preacher's first focus, we see God justly develops his correcting, cutting, and cleaning process, and different segments get attention. I don't know if you caught it as we were reading through these, uh, this text, but in each phrase, in each line of poetry, who was the subject of each line? We notice, first of all, in, in chapter 2, verse 1, How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger? We have here um, a, the same word that we started um, at the beginning of chapter 1 with, right? It started with um, Acha. Acha. How? How is it possible? How could God possibly do something like this? And so the second chapter starts um, just uh, with the same first word, and with the same first letter, of obviously, right? As he, um, each one of these is an acrostic and dealing with um, each verse being uh, starting with one letter of the alphabet. He's starting out um, the first word of the first letter of the second uh, poem, just like he did the first. How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud? And then we see from there on out, it's the Lord who is acting. It's the Lord who has an active role in the way he is developing um, this, this poem. So here we see the Lord has covered. We talked about the word covering last week. Remember how a covering indicates shame or mourning, right? Um, now, it can in indicate protection, and we know that uh, the covering of the cloud for Israel, as they wandered through the wilderness, was um, a, a protective feature, right? The Lord was actually um, taking care of them. He was protecting them from the beating of the sun. Right? But here, um, this cloud that covers the daughter of Zion is actually creating a barrier. It's creating a boundary. It's creating a separation between the Lord and his church, or the Lord and his nation of Israel. Secondly, we see the casting down. And cast down from heaven unto earth the beauty of Israel. 
Israel had achieved its highest glory in its relationship with the Lord. It had achieved um, the peak of uh, of divine spirituality in building the temple and establishing a place where God could be represented for all the world to see there in the building of the temple. Israel had achieved this position, this high heavenly place. And, you know, if we were to go to the New Testament in the book of Ephesians, it says that the church has this same position, seated with Christ in heavenly places. But nation, the nation of Israel as a people, or at least in the perception of the preacher here, and in the, its status as a nation state um, uh, among the nations in that part of the geography of the world, Israel had been cast down from that place had been cast down to earth. The beauty of Israel had been cast down. And thirdly, it says the Lord remembered not. The Lord has not recalled. He has um, blotted a certain part of his memory in, in such a way that Israel is his footstool. What is a footstool? A footstool is a servant. A footstool is someone who accomplishes the will of the master. If God sits on a throne, if God is God in heaven, Israel is God's footstool. And yet, he hasn't even given it that level of dignity in the day of his anger. In, in as I um, think about this and we're and and we see the Lord um, we're gonna see very graphically and very specifically actions that the Lord has taken to meet out retribution right to apply pain and suffering to the nation of Israel to accomplish, um, to act according to his anger and according to his fury. And as the Lord is doing this, um, some questions may come up into our mind. You know, is God fair? Certainly the nation of Israel was asking that question. There were many people asking that question. In fact, it was beyond the comprehension of the prophets in Israel at those days. It was beyond the comprehension of the priests in those days to even think that God would do something like this to the nation of Israel. And so they said, peace, peace. Israel's at peace. Don't worry about all these rumors. You know, Jeremiah was a lone voice at that time. And, and God said, yeah, you're the only one. And everyone else is preaching lying stories. Everyone else is saying peace, peace when there is no peace. So the question arises, you know, is God fair? Who um, can we believe in a God who allows bad things to happen to his people? And so um, in, in, with that kind of thought process, that kind of mentality, that kind of question in the back of our minds, um, I was thinking about... Um, a brother who has spoken on this topic extensively over the last 30, 40 years. We know, um, unfortunately, and our heart goes out to his family as he passed just yesterday, Brother Ravi Zacharias. But in, in one of the um, last messages, we were listening to it um, just a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, we knew that he was in, in bad health. And we were um, watching one of his messages, but he said he's an apologist. He's and most of his ministry has been an apologist. And he asked the question, "Do people believe in absolutes?" And he says, "Yes, even the most atheistic person believes in absolutes. What do they believe in? The absolute of love and the absolute of justice. It's the people who say they don't believe in God, 
who hold to, who cling to this idea of justice, that there has to be justice in the world. There has to be social justice and, you know, fairness, this idea of fair and balance. If, if there is no God and if there is no standard, how can there be any sense of justice? And so that is an argument that, that comes out as we consider whether or not God is just. The answer is yes, God is just. And in fact, even the heathen acknowledge that justice is an absolute in the world and that it should be. And they want to hold, even in their, um, in their twisted way of thinking, they want to hold others accountable to a standard of justice. So, I, whenever I look at these eight verses, these nine verses here in Lamentations chapter 2, that is my frame of mind, is that God is just. We saw that Jerusalem professed that at the end of chapter 1, right? The Lord is righteous. The Lord is righteous. And righteous means that He does the right thing for the right motive in the right way. Right? He does everything right. He does everything exact. He does everything according to His commandment, according to the law. And we see that, at, that um, conclusion there in chapter 2, verse 17, that the Lord acts according to His law. So as we move into our next verse, verse 2 here in our text, it says, The Lord has swallowed up all the inhabitations of Jacob and hath not pitied. God is big, he is powerful, and he has just gobbled up the families of Israel. There is no pity left. He saw the little children being killed. He saw the women being killed. He saw the young men with their promise and vivacity and youth and strength. And he didn't pity. And he didn't care. And he destroyed them. He hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. Any place that they had any kind of security in, right? The home, the, the, the forts of Judea, every one of them, any tower, any castle that you think, hey, this is a place that the enemy can't get me, any of those places have been knocked down. The stones have been unpiled. The... um. It's left an archaeological dig, right? Just just scattered stones everywhere. And he hath brought them down to the ground. He hath polluted the kingdom and the princes thereof. So this is kind of an overview, right? God's gobbled up the families. He's knocked down the structures. And he has polluted, he has desecrated the kingdom and the princes thereof. Those who were of the tribe of the, who were of the descendant of David, and um, what we see here in this second verse is that God has taken a hard look at every one of His covenant relationships in His anger, and those covenant relationships have taken a hard look, and they have been exposed to His wrath and to his anger. As we move into verse 3 and verse 4, this analogy and this picture takes on dramatic proportion and he uses the analogy of fire. He hath caught off in his fierce anger all the horn of Israel. The horn of Israel is anything that is forceful, anything that is strong, the army. The... Um, the prowess of the kingship, anything like that is the horn, right? A horn has the idea of power, uh, of might, of authority, and all that has been cut off from Israel. 
He's drawn back. Oh, this is this is the secret here. He hath drawn back his hand, his right hand from before the enemy. So the enemy couldn't touch Israel as long as God had protected them with his hand. As long as God has in in um in circled them and as long as the angel of the Lord encamps round about them to deliver them the enemy can't touch them but whenever God pulls away the protection of his hand now the enemy is allowed access he burned against Jacob like a flaming fire and hath devoured round about he hath bent his bow like an enemy. What? The Lord has become like our enemy? He stood on his right, with his right hand as an adversary. So we have the picture of fire. It um, burns indiscriminately, right? It will, it will consume anything in its path, anything that is perishable. And that's one of the interesting um, points here. Anything in its path that is perishable, anything that is consumable, anything that is like paper or wood or plastic, or that has any any kind of uh, of that can catch fire, any of that stuff will be consumed. Now, there's some things that may not be consumed. Um, even heat. I mean, even metal can melt and can be um, reduced because of that. But because of fire. But anything that is consumable. Um, this brings me to, um, I was doing a little bit of reading here in um, John Owen. The, the Puritan uh, theologian John Owen from 1600s. And he has a dissertation called A Dissertation on Divine Justice. And he says here, In this treatise we are to discourse of God and of his justice. The most illustrious of all the divine perfections, but especially of his vindicatory justice. Vindicatory justice. In other words, the justice in which God vindicates his law of the certainty of which I most firmly believe that all mankind will, one time or other, be made fully sensible, either by faith in it here, as revealed in the Word, or by feeling its effects to their extreme misery in the world hereafter. As the human mind is blind to divine light, and as both our understandings and tongues are inadequate to conceive of God aright and to declare Him, hence that common and just observation that it is a terrible thing to speak of God aright. A much darkness rests upon divine things, as it says in Euripides, that we may handle so important a subject with that reverence and per perspicuity wherewith it becomes to it to be treated. We must justly depend on his aid, who was made the righteousness of God for us himself. God bless forever. And in a definition, he says, we think it proper to divide this dissertation into two parts. I'm sorry. Uh, let me um, skip that. They divide, um, he divides the, um, the justice of God both into what is said, God is right in what he says, in his creating and in his legal power, and in what is done, in his fulfilling and in his executing power. The justice of God absolutely considered in the universal rectitude and perfection of the divine nature. For such is the divine nature antecedent to all acts of his will, and suppositions of objects toward which it might operate. This excellence is most universal, not from its own nature as an excellence, 
Can it belong to any other being? So the fact that God is righteous isn't meaning that God is righteous and that righteousness is a perfection that God has. Now this is an interesting concept. Please follow me here. Righteousness isn't simply this external standard, this external standard by which all things are judged, and therefore um, God also, being a, a, being a good guy, adheres to this standard of righteousness. Rather, God is the definer of what it is to be righteous. That's an important and, by his definition, has created, has worked out righteousness in every area of the universe. And therefore, the standard of righteousness is upheld in all things as a universal principle because God upholds it based on his own personhood. Okay, so I hope you can follow this extremely important distinction. Let me put it this way. John Piper um, puts it um, like this, and I think he's right. God believes in his own attributes and their individual worth. God is absolutely has absolute faith in his own attributes, and therefore we also can have faith in his attributes. God is selfishly vindictive of his right and his righteousness. And he is the only being that has any right to righteousness because he defined it by himself. Okay? Now, I know this is hard to deal with and hard to wrap our minds around, but there's one other concept that I want us to hold as we're thinking about this, and that's the concept that that uh, some of God's attributes seem to be compartmentalized. So we say God is perfectly righteous, and then we want to talk about God's mercy, and we're going to get there, Lord willing, in chapter 3, when we get there, we, we, we see the pinnacle of mercy, but don't, don't let that spoiler um, divert our attention from the topic tonight. The topic tonight is that God is righteous. All right, That's what's presented in these verses here in chapter 2. God acts absolutely rightly, and he is right to do so. And his righteousness is universal and must be answered in every circumstance in the universe, bar none. So file that away, keep that in mind, and we're going to come back to that at a later time. Okay? Let's go on to verse 5. In verse 5, we see how the righteousness of God, God takes a hard look at every one of his covenant situations. Every one of his covenant situations. If we go back to the Adamic Covenant, God creating the family, right? The Adamic Covenant is that God told Adam, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, have dominion, and subdue it. So the Adamic Covenant has to do with God creating the family as the original institution and giving the family ultimate dominion over his creation. And yet here... We saw there in verse 2 and verse 3 that God is taking away his hand from the preservation of the children of Israel and allowing the family to be killed. It's, he didn't just bring wrath and anger on the father as the head of the family, but women that were under the protection of, of, of the men 
were being killed and carried away captive and you know and raped and everything else that you can imagine in this scenario The Lord was as an enemy. He keeps reiterating this in verse 3, verse 4, and now again in verse 5. He says it again. The Lord is just like our enemy. Now, obviously these verses are all focused on what the Lord is doing, on the Lord's action. But, as we'll see in the next verses, 9 through 16, what about man? Why is the Lord become as an enemy? Wasn't it because man himself had made himself at enmity with God through violation of God's righteousness, of God's righteous law. And of course, that is the true scenario. But in the sense of his acts, God has become an enemy. God is acting as an enemy. He is destroying Israel. Oh, back up, I'm sorry, back up to verse 4 again. He hath bent his bow like an enemy. There it is. He has stood with his right hand as, as an adversary. Again, he's using these metaphors, as and like, these words, these metaphoric words that indicate that God is like an adversary in the way he is dealing with Israel. It says, he slew all that were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion. If there is one place that we take more delight in than anywhere else, it's our home, right? It's with our children. It's with our wife. And God has systematically broken that down for the, na for the nation of Israel here. At this point in time, he poured out his fury like fire. Fires even consume homes, even consume our most precious treasures, our keepsakes and our, and our cedar trunks and our memory books and our photo albums. Secondly, we see that he dealt with, he, um, he addressed the Abrahamic covenant. Israel, uh, we, we already talked about it, but I'm just trying to bring it to our forefront systematically here, right? Israel had a covenant with God that they would be the nation to represent God, a special nation. The Abrahamic covenant, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed, and they were cast down from heaven to the earth, right? As we saw in verse 1. Thirdly, we see we see dealing with the priests, right? The priests, the, the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant had established Israel not only as a family uh, uh, that would represent God, but now as a national institution, right? Having their own homeland, their own laws, their own geography. After their exodus from Egypt and under the Mosaic Covenant and the, the lining out of that um, legal system and, and governmental system and and um, ritual system in, in which they were to worship God, Israel was um, to represent God. And now the priest has no immunity from the destro destroying hand of God. The Levite has no immunity He hath dis increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. If you can imagine 
a key a keening a wailing uh a sobbing of someone who is just destitute, has lost everything. And it just gets louder and louder. More voices added to this keening. The Davidic covenant that promised that there was going to be a king to sit on David's throne forever. That God took a hard look at the kingship and said, no, their time is up. They have not walked in my ways as my servant David did. God has swallowed up their palaces. He's destroyed their strongholds. He's increased in the daughter of Judah, mourning and lamentation. Verse 6, he hath violently taken away his tabernacle. Here again, the picture of the family. Now, this is an interesting word. This, this particular word, tabernacle, in verse 6, is talking about a booth. Sukkot. Um, in the fall of the year, there is the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, in which people will build these makeshift um, shanties in, in order to remember Israel living in booths as they traveled through the wilderness after the exodus right and in this particular picture in this particular verse verse six you have these these fields these um agricultural fields um people would live together in small hamlets small um communities they would go out of town um, um just past the edge of town would be the beginning of all the fields and so, you know, um, the Legern family would have their field, and then right after that was the, the, the Hammerhead family, and right after that was, you know, all these fields lined out on the road out of town, you know, north, south, east, and west. And when you go to work in your field, you can't just run back to the house every five minutes, right? So they would actually build these tabernacles or these booths in a corner of the lot and so they would go and they would work in the field and then for lunch they would take a break and they would sit under the booth in the shade and eat their sandwich and take a little nap before they get back to work so that's the picture that's here in verse 6 it's a family picture it's a picture of Israel living in the land land flowing with milk and honey producing it in fact, it's God himself. This is his tabernacle. This is his booth. This is in the middle of his field, of his garden. And it says, as if it were a garden. And he is just done with it, right? He just throws it away. He's not going to spend any more time in this field. He's not going to spend any more time basking in the joy of his labors here in this garden. He's not going to spend any more time um, lounging in the shade with his family around him and celebrating just the, the, the joy of the greenery and the joy of the harvest and the joy of the planting and the joy of the agriculture there. It destroyed his, his places of the assembly. Even if it's not Jerusalem, where people come together and they conduct the business of the town and they, um, and they meet one another and they fellowship with one another, those places of assembly, those places where um, public business is conducted, those are destroyed, those are taken away. He's caused the solemn feast and the Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion as despised in the indignation of his anger, the king and the priest all the institutions that he established are being taken away look at verse 7 the lord hath cast off his altar not just the institution not just the people but the very tools the altar of sacrifice that indicated that god would accept 
a substitute is gone, carried away to Babylon. He hath abhorred his sanctuary. He hath given up into the hands of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the solemn feast. It's, it's kind of that picture um, where Moses is coming down from the, tent, from the hill uh, from Mount Horeb, having received the law of God in his hands. And Joshua's halfway down, and he catches up with Joshua here at the, at the curve, at the crook there in the mountain path as he's coming down. And Joshua says, you hear that noise? And he says, I can't tell if the people are shouting for battle or if they're rejoicing for joy. And of course, it was them celebrating this pagan feast. Well, that's kind of the picture here. There's a lot of noise going on in the house of the in the house of the Lord, but it's a very confused sound. It doesn't, you know, it might be a celebration, but we kind of think that there's a lot of hollering, there's a lot of screaming, and it may be because of destruction, shouting because of war. They've made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of a solemn feast. The Lord has even destroyed his own temple, his own church. Now we come to verse 8. The Lord hath purposed to destroy. This isn't a whim. This isn't a momentary reaction. It's not a um, a a kick. At, you know, it's not a reactionary kick. But the Lord has sat down, calculated, and caused the. In his righteousness, he's caused the books to be balanced. The negatives, their sin. And so, therefore, bringing about just condemnation and just revenge and just vindication of his righteousness. He hath purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He hath stretched out a line, right? He, he used his righteousness as the measure and as he as he lean as he stretches out this line of measurement then he it's found wanting just like it says in the book of daniel the lord stretched the line on the nation of babylon later found them wanting he weighed them in the balances found them wanting and therefore he executed justice what has god done this is God actively taking in hand this process of judgment against the nation of Israel. There's a verse in the scripture. I was trying to find the um, quote. I think it's in Isaiah. Is there evil? And the Lord hath not done it. And this is a, a hard thing for our theology sometimes. What is God doing? What is God accomplishing? And then the saddest thing of all, we have even the marker here in the very last of verse 8. We have even the marker till this day. Based on this verse, it says, Therefore he made the rampart and the wall to lament. And, and, and in a curious and ironic way, the Lord allowed one piece of the temple to, to remain as a marker for weeping. And, and we know that the, the temple was rebuilt, and then it, again, the city of Jerusalem destroyed again in 70 AD by the Emperor Titus, or he was actually a general at that time, but he came, later became emperor. Um, so in 70 AD, Titus destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple, and you can even go, if you went to Rome, you can actually see the, the frieze there over the, 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 the triumphal arch of Titus that has his army carrying out the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. It's a sad place. 
And to this day, the Lord allowed that western wall to stand and to remain. It's called, what is it called? It's called the wailing wall, right? Or the weeping wall. They languished there together. So, these first eight verses are acting, are, are very strong, strong language, active language. God taking an active stance and executing justice. And then the, the, next, uh, the next verses that we'll cover next week, um, God, uh, they're looking at the situation from a passive standpoint. Um, and then in verse 17, after, after the first eight verses talking about God's action, the next eight verses, verses 9 to 16, talking about a passive view of the circumstance, kind of a 360 view of, of where they're at. Then in verse 9, 17, he comes back and he reiterates the conclusion. And he says, The Lord hath done that which he hath devised. The Lord accomplished this. This is God's doing. He planned it. Whenever he established himself as a righteous God, he established a sense of balance, right? This is the right thing. When you don't do the right thing, you experience um, the consequences of not doing right. It says there in verse 17, He hath fulfilled the word that he had commanded in the days of old. He hath thrown down and hath not pitied, and he hath caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee, and hath set up the horn of thine adversaries. And so, as a conclusion, that's what God did. That what, that's what God has accomplished there. Um, I know we're running short on time. I wanted to take a quick look at judgment in the New Testament. The children of Israel have an opportunity. Uh, the church, I'm sorry, the church has an opportunity to hear from God. All of our works, too, and I'm just going to read the one in, in 1 Corinthians 3. Um, there's the, the scriptures if you want to look at them yourself. But let's just read very quickly. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, one of the scariest passages in the, in the scripture for me. Um, as Paul is talking about participating with God in building the kingdom, participating with God in building the church. He says, we are labor, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry, right? God's garden. And you're God's building, God's temple. So he uses those two pictures again, the garden and the temple, based on covenants that God's made. According to the grace of God, which is given me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation Another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed, be careful, watch out how you build on that foundation. I've laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, that is Jesus Christ. You see, the righteousness of God isn't just a thing, and it's not just a line. And it's not just an abstract concept. The righteousness of God is a person. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has, he has his creating or his verbal righteousness in which he established what righteousness is. And he has his um, physical righteousness in which he died and paid the price. He bore the wrath of God upon himself to indicate that he was the righteousness of God, that he would receive the full outpouring of God's righteous judgment, God's righteous penalty and punishment for sin. 
So not only is Christ the standard of the righteousness and the creator of the righteousness, the establisher of God's righteousness, but he's also the fulfiller of God's righteousness by bearing the full brunt of the righteousness of God. No other foundation can any man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Going back to where we started, right? Whenever we think of the fire analogy, fire will consume what is perishable. Wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. Right? As we've seen here in Lamentations, there was a day in which God exacted justice. He said, all right, that's far enough. Today, you've got to pay the piper. Now, if any man lay, build upon it this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, those are the things that have been purified, that have been produced through the process of extreme heat and pressure and come out precious. Gold, silver, precious stones. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he will receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he will suffer lo loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So this isn't talking about man's salvation. It's not talking about the church's salvation. It's not talking about you as a believer losing your salvation. But it is talking about be careful how we work. That our works be constructed in Christ. And we believe that, right? We believe that whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, you do as in the presence of Christ. As to the glory of God. That every ever, every act that we take is sacral, is sacramental, in which we participate in and we serve Him, and we promote His kingdom, and we do His work. So as we consider the righteousness of God, may it not be a source of bitterness. May it not be a source of um, of distance. May we not turn our back on God, but rather may it be a source of, of incredible security. God believes in himself. He believes in his own righteousness. And for that very reason, he's going to uphold his righteousness by whatever means necessary. And therefore, we can trust in his righteousness. He will do what's right. And therefore, we can believe that when Christ paid for our sin, it was paid for fully, wholly, completely. And therefore, we can have confidence in His work on the cross because He is righteous. And the justifier, He is just and the justifier of those that believe in Him. Because we have confidence in the quality of his attributes, then we can have confidence in the, the things that pertain to us, that he will save us. We shall be saved, even as it is through fire or by means of fire. Though we pass through the fire, we shall not be, we shall not be burned. Though we pass through the water, they shall not overwhelm us. Right? But he'll bring us out into a luscious place. May the Lord add his blessing to this word. Let's pray. Father, as we pause and, and bring, come to a conclusion, as we meditate on these principles of your righteousness, may they flood our heart. May we be, Lord, sustained, not in our own strength or in our own merits, but in the precious and unwavering, unshaking commitment of Christ to his own righteousness.
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining. Um, we have our live broadcast on Sunday. And the Lord bless each of you.